Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives, and follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis by mailing a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. There's a missing episode in between uh, last week and this week. This week's episode originally aired September 30th, 1950, and the title is Clean Up. Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson in Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, authentic stories from their official files. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, clean up. Several years ago, the town of Kilman, Texas, boasted a population of slightly under 3,000 inhabitants. Until a wildcat gusher started a fabulous new oil boom. In a matter of months, the population rose to 12,000 as drillers, roughnecks, and other field personnel poured in. And behind them, like vultures, came the horde of racketeers, gamblers, and grifters. But even organized vice was not profitable enough for the boss of the crime syndicate, Frankie Gennaro. Gennaro started to move in on the oil business itself. Yeah, sure, Paul is alone, Stetson. Yeah, Frankie. In the shack with the light. What have we been getting from him? Herb's got the figures. Yeah, he's got uh, four wells in production. We've been getting 200 barrels a day. So what's his beef? He's still getting plenty. He choked the wells down. Says he won't pay off anymore. Yeah, we'll see about that. You better come in, too, Herb. Yeah, okay, Frank. Don't knock open it. Hey, what's the idea of busting in here? No idea, Paul. I hear you've had some kind of a misunderstanding with my boys here. There's no misunderstanding, Gennaro. You're just not getting any more oil from my wells. I'm not taking any more threats from you or your tin horn friends. Watch what you're saying, Paul. I'll say what I want. I'll not only say it to you, I'll say it to the law. Your mouth's got a loose trigger, Paul. Shoots off too easy. Right. Get out. Get out of here before I bend this pipe wrench over your head. Hey, I'm shot. Uh, Let go of me. Oh. Grab him, Frankie. Let me go. He's got a knife. Let him have it, Herb. Ah. Oh. He clipped me with that wrench. Well, he won't do it again, Sutch. This will teach the other operators not to get smart. Come on, Herb. Yeah. Let's get out of here. The death of Joe Powell sealed the lips of other frightened oil operators. And they said nothing as Frankie Gennaro continued to exact tribute from the smaller private companies. But Powell's murder aroused special interest of the Texas Rangers. Captain Stinson sent for Ranger Jace Pearson... You know what's been happening in Kilman since the oil boom started, Jace? Yeah, I've heard. I've got rangers in the town, of course. Good men. But they're too well known. We're being blocked all the way by people who won't talk or who are afraid to talk. 
I've never worked the Kilman district. I'm not known there. Well, that's why I sent for you. I want Kilman cleaned up, starting with Joe Powell's murder. But a man wearing a badge won't stand a chance. You want me to work without one? That's right, Jace. But not alone. We got a new man just transferred into the company, Steve Clark. You can work together. Good. You better brief me on the Powell murder. Well, all we've got is in the next room. And have a look. Ah, uh, here's some photographs taken at the murder scene. Hmm. Stabbed in the back. A belt and shirt twisted, though. Powell must have put up a fight before he went down. He fought all right. Look at this wrench. Yeah. Mm, blood stains and a few matted hairs on it. This the same wrench that was next to the body in the photos? The same one. Powell must have hit somebody with it before he was killed then. It looks that way. That means two or more men ganged up on him. He dropped one with a wrench, and then the other one stabbed him. That's the way I see it. Yeah, blood on the wrench been typed? Yeah. And here's a report from the lab at Austin. Typo, huh? Brown hair, Caucasian male. Micrometer measurements are there, too. And that's all we've got, Jace. How about a list of undesirables hanging out in Kilman? Oh, yeah, I got that, too. Here, mostly petty crooks, gamblers, and muscle men. Our boys run a few out and new ones come in. There must be one man at the top, though. Usually is, but which one? Uh, a few possibilities on your list here. This one, uh, Stutz Tracy? No, no, he's not big enough to be given the orders. Does he know you by sight? No, I just know a few of these names by reputation and photos. Now, here's another bad one. Herb Enfield. Yeah, I heard about him, too. Plenty. Supposed to be a real vinegarone. Yeah, he's tougher than the back end of a shooting gallery. Yeah, only he's not smart enough to cover up for himself. The only other possible boss I can see is this one, Frankie Gennaro. Uh-huh. Mm, got lots of arrests and a couple of indictments. No convictions. On the surface, his record's clean. He always has an alibi, and it always stands up. Well, I guess I'd better get started. Right. We'll go over to the barracks, and I'll introduce you to Steve Clark. You want to change your clothes, anyhow. Yeah. Well, the first job is to locate key men. When we find out who's making the wheels turn, we can put our badges on again and move in with a force. Well, the whole company will be standing by. You better warn the rangers in town not to let on they know me. Well, they've been warned. You'll be treated just like a stranger. You have anything to report, contact me directly. But be careful. And you better leave your car outside the town and just meander in on horses. Cowpokes? Yeah, just a couple of wandering cowpokes. I met Steve Clark. We dressed like a couple of cowpokes and, and parked our car outside of Kilman. It was almost midnight when we rode in. The town was sprawled all over the map, dotted with trailers and crude shacks thrown together from tin and old packing crates. Despite the hour, everything was going full blast. Plenty of low night. It sure is booming, Jace. Yeah. The hotel down a ways looks especially lively. Bet that isn't legal liquor they're taking on around here. Yeah, I bet there isn't much of anything here that is legal. A bunch of oil trucks coming through. You better get out of the way. Get over, Charco. Come on, boy. Over, boy. Over. over. Seems to me that it's kind of late for them to be hauling oil. Ought to be a daytime operation. Might be a shortage of trucks, Jase. Everything has to be hauled. No pipelines to the refineries yet. You think it might be hot oil? Maybe. We don't know why Joe Powell was killed, but if somebody had been stealing his oil and Powell found out about it, we'd have a pretty good motive. Yeah. But if those trucks are hauling stolen oil, they're being pretty open about it. Oh, oh boy. Listen to that racket. Yeah. Being pretty open about everything around here. Boy, you talk too much. Come on, Clark. Let's get us a room. Then I want to call the captain and find out about these night riding trucks. Any plan we had about staying at the hotel was cut short by the desk clerk. There wasn't a room available in the town. We hung around for about an hour before we found a rancher who told us we could bunk down in the loft of his barn outside of the town. Cleaning that mess up isn't going to be easy, Jason. Uh, it's going to be even tougher than it looks, Clark. 
Notice what happened when the sheriff and one of the rangers they know walked in? Yeah, and all the gambling stopped five minutes before they got there, and all the liquor disappeared. Whoever's running that place knew they were coming. No wonder our men haven't been able to get any place. We could have stopped that place from operating, Chase. We saw what was going on. That wouldn't do any good to show a badge and shut down one spot. We got to shut them all. But first, we got to hook them all together. Yeah, gets you right. Hey, look over there. Roadside phone booth by that gas station. You still going to call Captain Stinson? Yeah, it's a good spot. Station's closed. I'll take the horses back off the road and wait. I got through to Captain Stinson at his home. But what he had to say about the trucks wasn't encouraging. Yes, Chief, we've had reports on the trucks. They run every night. Have our men ever stopped any of them? Yes, but they seem to be all right, Chief. They have receipts for everything they're carrying. And the trucks are properly licensed. I still can't see why they're running at night. Neither can I, but there's no law against it. Well, hasn't the commission set a limit on the number of barrels each well can pump in a day? Yes, each well is allowed 300 barrels a day, as long as the present pressure holds. Have the operators been accounting for that much oil each day? Yes, the commission keeps a careful check. Operators report production of 300 a day. The trucking company receipts show haulage of 300 a day. And the figures at the refineries tally, too. It's a three-way check, Jase. I don't see how they could beat it. Well, I'm still convinced that Powell's death has something to do with hot oil. Well, I can't help you there, Jase. It's all in your lap. I'm hoping to match the hair the lab found on that wrench Powell used. But I need a motive to narrow down the field. <laughs> 12,000 people in town make a lot of suspects. Well, do the best you can. I will. I'm sending you a list of names. Men we spotted running gambling games and selling liquor at the hotel. We'll have to let them run for a while... Till we move in with a big broom. We'll raise dust whenever you're ready. For three days, I left Steve Clark wandering around town, spotting the rackets, while I rode through the oil field at night, striking up casual conversations with the pumpers wherever I saw one of the night riding trucks load up and leave. Howdy. Well, howdy. A little bit off your trail, ain't you, cowpoke? Yeah. Ah, uh, just riding around, wishing some of this land was mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we all wishing the same thing. I'm just going to have a donut, a little coffee. Uh, want a cup? Yeah. If your friends on the truck didn't drink it all. Them fellas? <laughs> They're always in too much of a hurry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can tie a horse to the derrick there. He'll be all right. Thanks. There you are. Thanks. Yeah, it's a funny hour for making oil pickups. What makes them haul so late? Oh, I don't know. They always take a full load? Uh-huh. Um, 100 barrels a clip, that's a full tank truck. Yeah. And field storage tanks hold 1,000 barrels each, don't they? Uh-huh. Uh, want a donut? No, thanks. checked with a few more pumpers, then rode out to the barn where Clark and I were bunking. I woke him up. Oh, oh, oh morning, Chase. What time is it? Almost six. What'd you find out? Oh, let me stretch here. Yeah, I've got another flock of names you can send on to the captain. Here you are. Hmm. Yeah. We've got just about every small-time hood staked out. Everything but the head man. Chase... I'm not so sure there is a head man. There's got to be. All the racketeers stick to their own game in their own part of town. They're all protected by the same muscle men. Yeah. So? So they belong to an organization. Otherwise, they'd be fighting among themselves, trying to move in on each other. Yeah. Didn't think of that. And dipping a finger in the oil business here, too. I'd swear to it. And that's big. We find the man on top of that, and we'll have the kingpin of the entire operation. Well, I'll keep looking around, Chase. No. No, let the town go for a while. From now on, we'll concentrate on the wells. When we get the man responsible for killing Powell, the whole thing will tumble like a house of cards. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Beginning one week from tomorrow, that's Sunday, October 8th, Tales of the Texas Rangers will be heard at a new time. Remember, our next show is Sunday, October 8th, one week from tomorrow. Now we continue with tonight's case.
Clean Up, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We staked ourselves out at Powell's Wells. For two days, we kept check around the clock on every load of oil that was hauled away, watching from a distance. It was a dead-end watch. Yeah, it checks out, Jase. Four wells, 300 barrels each per day, 1,200 barrel total. And that's what they've hauled away. Yeah, but since we've been here, nothing's been hauled from Powell's wells at night. Yeah, gonna keep watching them? Just for tonight, so we can measure the flow from the wells. You can keep the pumper busy for a while at 9 o'clock while I run a tape gauge into the storage tank. You'll have to check them again later. Yeah, I'll wander up and keep the pumper busy around 3 a.m. Then you can make the second check. We compare our figures and we'll know if those wells are really choked for 300 barrels each or if they're pumping more in the legal quota. Okay, Jase. Let's hope it works. We made the check. But we didn't have to do much figuring. The wells were on the nose. 300 barrels a day each, not a drop more. Well, that's it, Chase. And the refinery reports show that it's all going through. There's no hot oil to be accounted for. Well, it was a thought. Let's get the horses and turn in. Yeah. Guess Paul just happened to brush somebody the wrong way. Yeah. That oil angle would have helped plenty. Too bad. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? There's a car coming. Hey, yeah. He's turning up the road toward that rigging over there. Rigging isn't lit. Nobody's working there. It was a dry hole. Get low. Yeah. His lights will sweep this way when he turns. Hey, stopped at the dry hole, all right. Yeah. And look. Powell's pumper's walking across the field to meet him. Yeah, they're going up to the knowledge house on the rig. It's a funny place to be holding a meeting at this time of night. It's a cinch they don't want to be seen. That pumper knows more than he told us. Come on. What's the plan, Jase? Maybe we can slip under the platform of the rigging without them seeing us. If we can get under the knowledge house, we may learn a few things through the floorboards. We crept through the muddy channel that drained into the slush pit and got under the knowledge house. We were hidden, but we could hear them. Crooks will start making pickups again tomorrow night. Here? Yeah. Why not? Unless you think you're going to object. I can't do it. You know Powell changed the joke before... Before the... Before his accident? Yeah. All right, sir. How can I give you any oil? Well, sir, only pumping regular quotas. Have the chokes changed again. So they pump a little extra. I can't. Not without Miss Powell's okay. I'm working for her now. Maybe you didn't hear me. I said change the choke. Oh, I'm afraid, Studs. Must be Studs Tracy, Jason. Yeah. Well, don't right. look at me like that, Studs. Oh, I'm on the spot. Listen, you, we've got the operators in this field lined up. We don't intend to have any trouble with a wise guy pumper. No, 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 wait a minute, Stutz, wait a minute. Oh, what, 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 what'd you have to hit me with? Just to make you think. That's only a sample. Maybe you'd like what Paul got. Oh, don't talk like that, Stutz. I'll do what you say. Just, just tell me what you want me to do. I've already told you. The trucks will roll tomorrow night. Yeah. Don't disappoint them. Don't forget. Yeah. Tomorrow. He knows what happened to Paul, Jace. Let's grab him. No, no, stay down. He's not the head man. But I wonder why we haven't been seeing him around. Wish I could have gotten a look at his face. His voice sounded familiar. Yeah, you've seen mugshots of him in the photos we have. Hey, a fellow with the broken nose. That's right. Have you seen him around? Yeah, I think I have. Shh. Pumper's leaving. All right. How about it? You seen Stutz? Yeah, only this afternoon at the hotel. He was talking to Frankie Gennaro. Well, that's the first time either of us has seen him since we've been here. I heard him talking to Gennaro. He said he'd been up to Big D. In Dallas? What was he up there for? Well, that wasn't mentioned. They didn't talk much. All I know is that Stutz just got back. He'd been gone two weeks. Ah, uh, come on. We can get out of here now. Gone two weeks, huh? In other words, since Powell got killed. Yeah, what do you make out of that, Jason? He doesn't know just something about Powell's murder. I got a hunch he was in on it. Powell clipped one of his attackers with that pipe wrench, remember? Must have left a mark. And if Stutz had that mark, he wouldn't hang around and give people a chance to notice it. Is that it? Two weeks would just to be about long enough for a scar to heal over. 
We gotta get a sample of Stutt's hair to match with the hair samples lab got off that wrench. Well, how do we get that? We get our hands on a comb or brush. Anything he's used on his head. But first, we gotta find him. Well, he may have headed back to the hotel. That's a favorite hangout. Yeah, we'll try it. But on the way into town, I want to call the captain. Yeah. Uh, come on, Charcoal. Come on, boy. What are you gonna call the captain for? Find out who owns the trucks hauling the oil and what refinery they're going to. See if we can hook the ownership up with any of the people we've been watching here. Why? Well, because records have been falsified to cover that hot oil. We find out who's changing them, and we'll know who Stutz is working for and who killed Powell. Jay's hot oil won't prove murder. No, but once we link Stutz as an accomplice in the murder, I got a feeling he'll squeal like a pig caught under a gate. I made my call to Captain Stinson. He arranged to have the trucks followed and the ownership checked. Then Clark and I headed for the hotel where business was going on as usual. There he is, Jace, at the counter. They're using it as a bar. Uh-huh. Herb Enfield and Frankie Janelle. There's a trio the warden of Huntsville would love to have. Well, maybe you'll get him later on. Well, what do we do? Just wait around until Stutz combs his hair? No. Look, on the stool beside him. What? Oh, his hat. Is it his? Uh, it's the one he was wearing when I saw him this afternoon. Good. There'll be enough hair strands in it or little clippings in the band to tell us what we want to know. Jace, how do we get it? Uh, I'll call for a drink and crowd him. You just grab it and fade. You want me to take it back to the barn? No. Well, there's a small airfield near the next town. Get it over there and call the Austin lab and have it picked up. They can report to Captain Stinson. When I call him in the morning, he should have enough for us to start dropping the net. Stutz Tracy is the man Powell hit with that wrench, all right. Good. You get a line on the trucking company and the refinery? Yes, you like it. The trucking company is owned under an alias by Herb Enfield and his wife. Good. And the refinery is owned by a woman. We checked on her, Jace. She's Frankie Janeiro's girlfriend. Well, that does it. When are you coming in? Well, the whole company's standing by right now, ready to roll. Well, then come ahead and throw up roadblocks on the way. An awful lot of people are going to want to leave here in a hurry. We're ready to comb the town, Jace. You got a section for Clark and me? Take your choice. You know who I want. Good. Go ahead. The rest of the men have their assignments. Names you supplied. Listen, you people. All of you. Now, most of you are decent folks. Go home and stay home. The streets may not be safe for the next couple of hours, but by tonight, you'll have your town back. We'll use the hotel for a jail. All right, let's go. You men in there, you're surrounded. Come out with your hands up. All right, come on. Get moving. All right, all of you, up against the wall. And don't anybody reach for a gun. Anybody else want to try that? All right, Stutz, on your feet. Uh, what do you cow folks want? We're not cow folks. We're Texas Rangers. Rangers? But Get up. Get up. You're coming over to the hotel lobby. We'll tell you all about it. Well, that's quite a haul, Jace. Yeah, but I can't locate Herb Enfield and Frankie Gennaro. Clark's holding Stutz Tracy in that side room, though. He might know where the others are. You got the photos of the hair samples lab matched? Yeah. Here. Good. I'll show these to Stutz. They should convince him. He say anything yet, Clark? Jason, not a buzz. And I'm not going to say anything either. Stutz, I got something to show you. Ever seen anything like this before? Take uh-huh. a look at this photograph. What is it? Just a couple of hairs. One on the left came from your hat. We borrowed it last night. 
Uh, what's the idea? And the hair on the right is just like it. Exactly like it. That came from a bloody wrench we found beside the body of Joe Powell. Powell hit you with that wrench, Stutz, and then you killed him. I, I was never even near him. That hair and the scar on your head proves you were. Yeah, but, but I didn't kill him. You were there. You know who did. I was knocked out. I didn't see who was... Come on, Stutz. Who was with you? Uh, uh, ben Field and... Fra and Frankie Gennaro. Yeah. Oh, he'll kill me. He's gonna kill me. Gennaro's the boss, then. Yeah. He's got a hideout someplace. Where is it? No, he'll kill me. I, I... said, where is it? You, you gotta protect me. Uh. There's, there's a cabin up past the Red Cedars, other side of the oil field. That's where he's been living. You'll have a clear view of the road up there, Jason. We won't uh, use the road. Oh. We'll ride up from behind. Is Enfield there, too? Yeah. Yeah, they're always together. Jace, they might not even know we moved in on the town. They'll know soon. Yeah, there's a the cabin, Jace. Pretty fancy. Yeah, it ought to be. They've milked plenty out of this town. Yeah. Cow's running dry for him now, though. Hey, somebody around the side of the cabin there in a the hammock. There's Gennaro in a nice silk robe. He's in for a change of wardrobe he isn't gonna like. He's getting up, Chase. He sees us. You looking for something? Yeah. You're wanted in town. That's Tracy send you for me? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. Enfield, too. Anything wrong in town? I don't think so. You see anything wrong, Clark? No. No, I thought everything was fine. Hey, hurry! Yeah, Frankie? Stutz wants us in town. Sent these fellows out to tell us. Oh? Uh, I've seen you two around before, haven't I? Hmm? Hey, what's that on your shirt, cowpoke? Oh, that's just a Texas Ranger badge. Come on, both of you. You're going into town. You shady! You uh, fellas mind telling me what you think you've got on me? Well, let's start with the killing of Joe Powell. <laughs> I can prove I was someplace else when Powell was killed. Herb and Stutz and I were playing cards with three other men all night long. Not this time, Janelle. What do you mean? We've already proven where Stutz was, and he's made a full confession. There'll be no alibis this time. Don't move, Gennaro. Look out for Enfield! Oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to fight. You shouldn't fool around with a gun, Herb. A knife in the back is your specialty. Oh, my God. Well, I'm glad to see you know that I didn't kill Powell. Sure, Gennaro. You're the boy with the brains. You don't do the work. You order it. That's something you can't prove. No? You don't think Herb is going to take all the blame, do you? You're not going to set me up, Gennaro. Shut up. Oh. I want a lawyer. Yeah, I can understand that. I never saw a fellow who needed one more. All right. Get moving. Take it. Frankie Gennaro and Herb Enfield were sentenced to life terms at Huntsville. Stutz Tracy was given 50 years, and lesser offenders in the Kilman cleanup were given sentences of from one to five years. Those who were released without being charged left the town of Kilman quickly and quietly. The cleanup was complete. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Folks, here's a special announcement I think you'll be interested in. You'll next hear Tales of the Texas Rangers beginning Sunday, one week from tomorrow. Yes, we're moving to a brand new time on Sundays, beginning Sunday, October 8th. I hope you'll make it a point to hear us at our new time, beginning in just eight days. Good night, folks. See you next Sunday. A week from Sunday, Joel McRae and another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers.
Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, Paul Fries, Tom McKee, Herb Ellis, and Byron Kane. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking and reminding you to be with us again at our new time one week from tomorrow, Sunday, October 8th. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Next Saturday at this time, Dennis Day returns to the air. Dennis Day's comedy is always refreshing because he appears so timid and bewildered. But one thing that doesn't bewilder Dennis is how to sing a popular ballad or rhythmical novelty. So for comedy and songs, it's Dennis Day at this time next Saturday. That day also marks the return of the Judy Canova Show. And tomorrow, Phil Harris and Alice Fay return to NBC. Welcome back. Well, it's not very specific as to when this story was set. However, doing a little bit of research, it seems likely that this was something that happened with the Texas Rangers back in the 1930s. In 1930, the East Texas oil field was discovered, and a lot of towns took off in their growth, as happened in today's episode, but the growth was overwhelming and did open the door for various criminals and racketeers to come in. It was so dramatic for some places you know, they were unincorporated, and then they were growing to uh, populations of several thousand people, millions of dollars of business going on. It's not hard to see how this would be too much for law enforcement to deal with. And, of course, just the economic value of the area, the potential for being able to really establish a criminal network that would reach throughout the state, that explains the really high deployment of rangers. Because, remember, at this point, there were 50 Texas rangers, and you had two of them already known in town, and you sent in two more undercover. So you've got 8% of your force already in this, you know, small town. Now, the captain talked about bringing in the entire company, which sounds really huge, but not really, because Texas Rangers are divided into seven companies, or perhaps six if this happened before 1935. And if you have 50 rangers, that's seven, eight rangers in a company. Although there you know, may have been some realignment, some hiring of additional rangers to cope with uh, the issues specific to that, a particular area, you still would not be, you know, have like, you know, 50 or 100 rangers. You'd probably have, you know, five or 10 coming down to offer support. But kind of what happened in the story illustrates that there is some truth to the whole one riot, one ranger idea. I particularly liked the guy who, you know, he gave an order and somebody, you know, stepped out of line and was trying to come after him and you hear a shot and then he said, okay, does anyone else want to try that? That was a great moment. I, I, I enjoyed this episode. It was... Definitely interesting to have uh, Jace Pearson going undercover and having to work through a situation that was a bit different than his typical case. All right, well, uh, listener comments and feedback now. We start with an email from Jay. Jay uh, writes in, Dear Adam, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I recently finished the big book of pulps with a huge variety of pulp detective stories mainly from the 1930s. I was struck by the different worldviews in these stories compared to the old-time radio shows, mainly from the 40s and 50s from your great podcast. In the 30s stories, the police and local government are understood to be corrupt, except in some cases for one or a few heroic good cops. It's understood that both good and bad cops routinely beat suspects. 
When the good cops do so, it's to get information or confession from a criminal before he can be freed by the bad cops. The old-time radio world is very different. Cops may not be as smart as the detective hero, but they are almost always good guys, and they never or almost uh, never beat up suspects. What happened? Did the end of prohibition lead to less corruption and better public images for police or local governments? Or was there a higher level of censorship on the air than in the pulps? Uh, many thanks for your thoughts. Well, thanks so much, uh, Jay. And this is definitely a big area of uh, conversation. In many cases, the answer to the question of was it this or was it that is... Yes, the pulps and radio were entirely different based. The pulps were magazines and then a few limits. They could get away with pretty much whatever they wanted, whatever their particular reading public would uh, allow. Radio stations were FCC license. They depended on a broad market of listeners and broad public goodwill. Your grandmother might hate Black Mask Magazine, but who cares? Your grandmother is not part of their target market. They don't need her to buy things. However, if your grandmother is so offended by something that ends up going on the radio that she won't listen to any other programs on the radio uh, or on that particular station, that's a huge problem for the station. So they were often very, very cautious about the type of things that uh, they would air on uh, radio stations during the golden age of radio. There's an old a story that goes around that uh, Fred Allen was made to remove a joke from his script for fear it might offend rodeo fans. As a network, you are not going to lightly disparage the police in the same way that a pulp magazine might. So police corruption was always a sticky topic. I will say that we do have some radio programs from the 1930s, and in those programs, the police and often detective heroes tended to be a little bit rougher than what we hear uh, during the 1940s, you listen to a program like uh, Police Headquarters, and the language is rougher, and the men are a bit rougher. At the same time, there were legitimate efforts underway to reform police departments and policing. There were various anti-corruption uh, boards. There were reforms to uh, police procedures. Different sorts of leadership came in. There was also a focus on the importance of law and order during World War II and particularly after the end of the war. This was seen a lot of ways in uh, fiction. The saint was originally the Robin Hood of modern crime. He was a thief who frequently robbed other thieves, but occasionally he would play more on the side of the law, but it would ultimately be towards the end he had set up. But with the rise of Nazis and fascism, he became much more a character who protected society. And the same was true of a lot of other outlaw characters. Both Batman and Superman started working outside the law in their initial comic book appearances. Superman quietly made peace with the uh, police. Batman it was a bit more noted, and he became someone who worked hand-in-hand -hand with the police force. It should be noted that the detectives that dominated radio up until the end of the war were not uh, the hard-boiled sort at all. It was Charlie Chan and Ellery Queen and Sherlock Holmes, Nick Carter and Mr. Keene. Casey, crime photographer, was about as close as you got to a hard-boiled character until Rogue's Gallery, The Fat Man, and Ideal and Crime came along. In the post-war era, there was a great concern about juvenile delinquency. 
after World War I, there had been a huge rise in uh, juvenile delinquency, and they feared the same thing would happen after the Second World War, unless there was a concerted public campaign against it. Now, the First World War had been kind of a perfect storm for uh, the rise of the sort of uh, delinquency that you saw during the 1920s. You not only had the war, you had the uh, flu uh, pandemic, which led to a lot of restrictions on people's lives and certainly amped up some things. And then you added prohibition on top of that. And I guess you could add to that, there was also a lot of media, particularly literature, uh, that could glorify criminals. See for an example some of the early Boston Blackie stories. But this experience led people to believe after World War II that law and order, that respect for law, that teaching respect for police was incredibly important. Because if you went with an image of the police that was disrespectful, or discourage kids from reaching out to police or looking to the police for help, you risk turning the atomic era into another Roaring Twenties, or at least that was the theory. So the difference, I think there are multiple facets. There's difference in genre, difference in time, real-life progress that have been made, and also a cultural imperative to try and avoid uh, another increase in juvenile delinquency. So I hope that helped. Thanks so much for the question, Jay. And now it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Steve, Patreon supporter since March of 2016, currently supporting the show at the Master Detective level of $15 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Steve. And that will actually do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.